Hi class, uh, this is the first video for the first day of lecture. Uh, if you were with us today, we met uh, at our normal class period uh, meeting time so that we could just talk about how the class goes. Uh, but all the content in the course is gonna be delivered asynchronously. So I'll pre-record uh, lectures just like this one. I'll post them to the Canvas site so that you can watch them whenever it's convenient for you in whatever situation you find yourself in. Uh, now, as I said in the syllabus and as we talked about in the orientation uh, today, um, we are going to not have entire hour-long lectures uh, for you to sit and watch. Um, instead, I'm going to break them up into little smaller bits, so every lecture will have a couple of different videos uh, for you to watch. Um, they should be short and compact, maybe 10 minutes long, maybe 15 minutes long at most, uh, so that you can watch them um, in, in whatever time you have available to you. But uh, they'll be labeled so you can watch them in order, and then you get the full content of what we expected to talk about in any given lecture. Um, also at the website, uh, there will be the slides, the PowerPoint keynote slides that uh, you're going to see here in a moment when I start playing them. Those will be up for every lecture as well. And then I'll also scan my personal lecture notes. So these are the notes I wrote that tell me what I want to tell you in each of these lectures. Hopefully I'll remember to tell you all the things in those notes. Uh, but then there are also the notes that I wrote the slides from. So I'll make those available to you. Um, on the Canvas site uh, with the slides and the links to these videos as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna share these slides. Okay, so we are studying astrobiology. And if you look at that name, it is the synthesis of two scientific disciplines, astronomy and biology. And if you're not a scientist, you might ask, well, why should I care about this? But the subject of astrobiology is one that I think people think about. It's certainly things that people talk about. Um, popular culture examines uh, in many different instances whether you think about it in a scientific context or not. And that is the question of whether or not uh, we are alone in the universe or not. And that question has many facets to it, ranging from kind of melt your brain, super imagination kind of facets uh, to complex scientific numerical mathematical calculations uh, to philosophical and ethical questions as well. And so over the course of this uh, uh, quarter, we will touch on all of those different bits of it. Um, but today I just want to kind of take that, you know, 30,000 foot uh, overhead view about why we're interested in this topic. Okay. So each class, uh, each set of slides, I'll start with just a storyline about what uh, we expect to do that day. Um, so today we're going to talk about why we actually care about this topic. Um, you should also look on the website. I'm going to make a couple of extra bonus lectures. Uh, these are in principle optional for everyone, but they're really there for people who haven't taken a math class in a while or people who have a little bit of anxiety about their math. Um, we are going to have to do just a little bit of math in this course. We're going to have to talk about big numbers. We're going to have to talk about small numbers. We're going to have to be able to calculate some numbers. Uh, basic numbers with your calculator, um, and we're going to have to read and interpret graphs. Now, all those are skills you should have anyways. They're good skills to have as a citizen uh, of the world today, and certainly in the current global situation, I'm sure you're getting inundated with plenty of numbers and graphs. So um, I'm just going to review all of that. Um, for those of you who feel like you need a little bit of a refresher, they'll also be linked here with the slide. So look for those uh, probably tomorrow, actually. Uh, and then next class, after our discussion today, next class we're going to really talk about the size of the universe because that's the kind of first stop in thinking about uh, this question of whether or not we're alone in the universe. Uh, the answer to that question is the universe is big in many ways for those of you who want a preview of what we're going to talk about. So uh, as we said, astrobiology is a synthesis of two different distinct disciplines, astronomy and biology. And if you were to look up the definition of astrobiology in the dictionary, it might say something like this. It's the study of life beyond the Earth's atmosphere as it may be found on other planets. Now the first recorded uh, use of that is sometime in the 1950s or so. So right at the beginning of the space age. And it kind of makes sense that that's the first time that scientists and engineers first started paying attention to this. 
um, that was the first time we seriously had the option of actually extending our reach, extending our presence somehow, either physically as humans or th uh, through robotic technology beyond the confines of Earth. And so it very naturally led to uh, questions about whether or not we might be able to find life if we visited other worlds in our own solar system. Okay, but the question today that I really want to talk about is why should you and I, why should we care um, about this topic? Now, this is a picture of the Orion Nebula. Uh, it is uh, visible to the naked eye if you're not in the city of Chicago, if you get out in the countryside out where it's a little bit dark. Um, Orion is set for the season right now, but in the fall you'll be able to see it again. Um, it is uh, just a fleck of light if you look at it with your naked eye, but through a telescope we can see that it is a nebula here. And one of the things that we've discovered just in the last couple of decades is that there are stars and indeed planets forming around uh, those stars in the Orion Nebula. This is one of many places where we see this happening. Now, you and I can ask this question about whether or not there's life elsewhere in the universe using the fact that we understand something about the nature of the universe away from the earth already. But if you go back through human history, there has definitely been times in the past where people didn't know all the things that you and I know. And even so, if we go back to our ancient cultures and the origins of our ancient religions, we find this idea of cosmic pluralism uh, is very common, which is the idea that there are worlds other than the Earth out there in the cosmos, and that those worlds probably and must necessarily harbor life. And that's a very curious viewpoint to have uh, for ancient humans because it wasn't until the invention of the telescope that we actually even knew there were worlds other than the Earth. And so to be able to imagine and uh, speculate that there are planets other than the Earth somewhere else in the universe is kind of an interesting uh, exhibition of the human ability to kind of create things out of pure thought, um, to justify them based on their common experience, the fact that we are alive and we live on a planet itself, um, and then to uh, uh, indoctrinate those ideas into part of our culture. So the idea that there has been uh, the possibility of life elsewhere in the universe is actually a very old one in many uh, human cultures. Now, most of us have been exposed to that idea um, through speculation, uh, you know, chit-chatting with your friends over a barbecue on Saturdays, wondering whether or not, you know, uh, aliens have visited Earth or if we might ever see UFOs or, or who knows what, um, whether or not there's life on Mars or NASA's Mars rovers might find them, uh, but also primarily through fiction. Um, and there is a long history of speculating about life uh, elsewhere in the universe in fiction. Uh, the earliest known, uh, what we would call science fiction novel, uh, is a story called A True Story, which was written by Lucian of Samosoda. Uh, this is in Assyria, which is in modern day south, uh, southeast Turkey, uh, in the second century. And so this was a science fiction story uh, where he speculated on life uh, elsewhere on other worlds uh, in the universe. More modern fiction, uh, the kind of uh, beginning of modern uh, alien invasion stories really was The War of the Worlds written by H.G. Wells. Uh, this was serialized in 1897 and speculated not on life from elsewhere in the galaxy, but life from elsewhere right here in the solar system. What would, uh, what would happen if there was life on Mars? those Martians looked at Earth with envious eyes and invaded the world. And so this, as most of us know, uh, gave uh, uh, spawn to an entire genre of alien invasion fiction, uh, which persists to this day. The first science fiction film uh, was this one by Georges Méliès. Uh, it was a film called Le Voyage dans la Lune. It was the first science fiction film. It was one of the first films where special effects were used. 
Uh, this was in the very early days of motion pictures, and Melier was very much a genius at uh, experimenting with how he could film things with multiple film reels, put them together, recombine them, and make a single, uh, uh, a single film that people could watch. Uh, this uh, film was a smash hit when it was released. Um, you can still watch it online if you go look for it. Uh, but in 1902, he speculated on what would we find if we went to the moon. And indeed, uh, in that film, there are inhabitants on the moon. So this has, uh, this has given rise to an entire industry today. There are entire industries centered around the making of films and certainly entire industries around the writing of science fiction stories about life elsewhere in the universe. So most of us have encountered this sort of thing at some point in our lives, and it's those kind of early experiences that have often informed some of our thinking, some of our intuition, some of our beliefs, some of our fondest imaginings about what life elsewhere in the cosmos might be like, okay? But we can imagine all kinds of things, right? And just because we can imagine them doesn't necessarily mean that they're true, okay? So the real question we want to answer, the question we're going to try and answer in this course is, is it reasonable to imagine that there's life elsewhere in the cosmos. And there's kind of two ways that you can come at that. There are certainly personal answers. What do you personally think? Do you think there's life elsewhere in the universe? Do you think it's common? Do you think it's uncommon? Do you think the Earth's the only place? You might have an answer that's different from what your roommate has, and it may be different than the answer that I have, okay? But there are also scientific answers to that question. Science has the ability to tell us things about whether or not something is alive, for instance. Um, it has the ability to tell us how we might look for, how we might answer the question of whether or not there is life elsewhere in the cosmos. It has the ability to tell us what's the likelihood that we might find life elsewhere in the cosmos. It has the ability to guide us towards the most likely places where we might find life in the cosmos. Okay, so that's kind of different than your kind of personal answers that you might have. And indeed, for most of this course, we're going to focus on what are the scientific contexts for uh, asking the question of whether or not there's life in the universe. Now, certainly what's going to happen is you're going to learn a lot about the scientific quest to answer this question. But what will happen, certainly, and what we expect to happen is by the time we get to the end of the course, your experiences and your understanding about what science has to say about this question may certainly change what you think your personal answers are. And we'll come back to that in, uh, in a little bit. Okay, so let's, let's just kind of provide a little bit of context to start with about whether or not we should uh, think seriously about this question. So, so this is the way that I often start. So this is probably one of the most famous pictures that NASA has ever taken. So this is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, basically, when we launched Hubble, we found several spots in the sky where we couldn't see anything at all. And so we asked Hubble to go back to those places in the sky and take pictures of them over and over and over again. So this picture is an exposure that is 23 days long. Okay, uh, it's in the uh, constellation Eridanus, if you go look at it on star map, but there's a little spot there, but we didn't see anything. We asked Hubble to look there over the course of 10 years. It looked and looked and looked and looked until it stared at that one spot for 23 entire days. Okay, now what you see here is a picture and every fleck of light that you see is another galaxy. Okay, and uh, what we wanted to do with this image is that if I take the size of this image on the sky, okay, so how big is it on the sky? Well, if you take a dime, okay, and you hold it up out at your arm's length, the picture you're looking at right now is about the size of Roosevelt's eye on that dime held out its arm's length, okay? And so if I take a space of the sky that big and I count all the galaxies I see in this picture, I get about 5,000 galaxies. And so if I multiply that up to cover the entire sky, assuming every bit on the sky is exactly the same, no different than this one, then we get there are some 500 billion individual galaxies 
in the entire universe. Okay, so that's a lot of galaxies. Now, we can assume, quite reasonably actually, that every galaxy is not unlike the Milky Way. Now, that's not completely true. Some galaxies are smaller than the Milky Way, some galaxies are bigger than the Milky Way, but if I take a gigantic pile of galaxies and I look at their average size, it ends up being they're more or less going to be about the size of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is an average, everyday, run-of-the-mill kind of galaxy. Okay, so if I assume that every galaxy is kind of like the Milky Way, the Milky Way itself has some 200 billion individual stars in it. So if I take those 500 billion galaxies and I multiply them by the 200 billion individual stars, then I get there are 100 billion trillion stars in the entire universe. Okay? Now, I'm using these numbers for you, right? 500 billion stars, 100, sorry, 500 billion galaxies, 100 billion trillion stars, okay? And we get very blasé about using big numbers like this, okay? And so I like to remind all of you just how big these individual numbers are, okay? And so the way I tend to do that is I ask you a different question first. If you wanted to count to one million and you said one number each second, one, two, three, four, how long would it take you to count to one million? Okay, so if you do that, it will take you 11 days, 13 hours, and 47 minutes to count to one million. So what if you wanted to count to one billion? One, two, three, four. It would take you 31.7 years. Okay, so to count to 500 billion, if I sent you out into your backyard and asked you to count every galaxy that's on the sky, it would take you 15,855 years to count every galaxy on the sky, okay? It takes a long time to count to these enormous numbers. They are huge. They are so big compared to any number you have any experience with. But we get very used to just talking about them like they're ordinary everyday numbers, okay? But they're huge, okay? And 100 billion trillion um, is even larger, okay? Now, what's the point here? Well, the point is, is that every star, this is only something we've learned in the last 10 years or so, is pretty much just like every other star and very likely has its own system of planets. And so if every star has its own system of planets, then there could be as, million as, as many as a trillion, trillion planets in the entire universe, okay? That's a lot of planets. And in all those planets, the question we're asking in this course is whether or not it's likely there's life somewhere else. Now, in all of those planets, this planet is the only planet that we know of with certainty where there is life. Okay? And that inspires a lot of deep awe in most of us. When you put so many different worlds on the, on, the, uh, on the table, and then you posit it against the statement that this is the only world where we know there's life, it kind of makes you think hard about what's going on. There are two possibilities, and I'm going to give you two quotes here that I think kind of reflect the way people often feel about this. The first is from Arthur C. Clarke, and he said, two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe, or we are not. And both thoughts are equally terrifying, okay? The other quote is kind of a similar quote, but it's from Buckminster Fuller, and he said, sometimes I think we're alone, and sometimes I think we're not, and in either case, the thought is staggering. Okay, now those are, more or less saying or talking about the same thing, but they reflect two very different um, 
ethos about what you personally feel about the notion that there may or may not be life elsewhere in the cosmos, okay? So I'm gonna ask you on one of our first assignments to think deeply about these two quotes and come at this question about whether or not there's life in the universe and thinking about the fact that the Earth's the only place where we know there is life and decide how you feel about this, okay? So you're gonna give some, some more thought to that here very shortly in this course. So the last thing I want to say right now is astrobiology is really more than just the synthesis of astronomy and biology. Even though we call this astrobiology, if we look at all the disciplines that we need to think about, that we can think about, that we will think about in our study of this topic, they will cover a vast range of different uh, knowledge bases that we as the human race have. And they range from things that are definitely science, like physics and chemistry and astronomy, to things that aren't necessarily science, uh, philosophy, ethics, history, sociology, linguistics, all of these things here, and certainly many more that I haven't listed or haven't even thought about, have bearing on what we think about the question of whether or not there's life elsewhere and how we go about answering the question of whether or not there's life elsewhere. Okay, so keep this in mind. Um, all of you, not all of you are science majors. In fact, I think most of you are not science majors, but uh, even in your discipline, there are going to be people who think about this question and there are going to be the things that your discipline contributes uh, to the search for life elsewhere. And we will talk about that a lot more as the quarter goes on. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. I'll see you in the next lecture. And I hope uh, all of you are having a good day. And we'll talk again soon, okay? Bye-bye.